want to thank all of you for coming out to the program today. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a good one. Um, I was involved with the state yeah. program. I came off the Rock Island in 1976. In 1978, I believe it was at Christmas time, we had a party over at Linda Mary's house, and John Barker was drinking schnapps, and I was standing in the middle of the Christmas tree. We decided to do 3985. From there on, it went into us becoming part of the original scheme. Um, we got involved with doing the Challenger. We did the double header to California with the mechanic department, which ran the program then. And then when we came back, we surrendered our rights to the steam engine to the mechanical. <coughs> We had Cal Rope, who was a traveling road farmer that traveled with us on those trips and the early trips after that. And then Cal retired, and Steve had come out from the Rock Island seeking a better future, and he found it on the UP. Uh, he was a road farmer on the west side of Cheyenne, and he got assigned. He helped us out with some stuff while we were doing the restoration at that time. But uh, he became really involved with traveling with them. What, about 83? It was about 83, 82. 1982. And he traveled with the mechanical guys. And then in 1989, they were going to do a commercial for General Motors. <coughs> they tried to sell a few station wagon. We went up on Sherman Hill. And the mechanical department wouldn't release the firemen that they used to have for the trains. So Steve went to Omaha and asked Jerry Davis, Vice President of Operations, if he could get four of us off the old 3985 Restoration Committee to help fire the engine for them for that commercial. And they agreed to us. So we each took a half a day. As it turned out, Lynn and I were assigned the job. And the commercial never hit the TV because after it went back to the cutting room, they looked at it and said, the steam engine outclasses the car too much, we can't have this. And we still looked at the car. <laughs> after that, um, Lynn and I would work our turns and then come in two weeks before trips. And Steve would bring us in. And we would uh, help to set up for the trips do the trips with him and then help for a couple of weeks and go back out on our turns. Then in 1990, he worked on uh, the boys in Omaha and he got Lynn and I assigned full time to the crew. So basically, the crew started out with Steve and Lynn and I. We had Art Lockman and Ron Tabke and Jim Adams from the uh, mechanical department that got assigned to the mechanical <coughs> side. And then that crew too. Steve grew the program over the 13 years I was there to a point where, well, you know what it was. It was a great program. Everybody really enjoyed it. It was a pleasure all those years to work for Steve. He's a good friend and a mentor. And now I present to you Steve Lee. This, uh, this show is courtesy of him. I want to tell you first off that I retired from the Union Pacific in December of 1910. So anything I have to do, 2010. In spite of that, I'm here to give you. Oh, 
Craig asked me about they should go out to Dallas Air Force Base and rent a bunch of big helicopters and just pick it up. Uh, he said we could drill holes in that big black thing and run cables through. <laughs> <laughs> that black thing being the boiler. <laughs> Not the smoke lift, And the tender. We'll just pick it up with other helicopters. Having no idea that it weighs 454 times. I got to see that. <laughs> They did their thing and came back. I was on it a couple of times going down to Denver and back in the next year or two for uh, transportation week. This was after they quit doing the stock show in January. And they weren't doing the Frontier Days train in July, but they we were going down there every May and displaying it at Union Station for a week uh, for transportation. So I'd be involved in some of that. But other than that, it ran around the system uh, just fine on its own. We had some uh, challenges with it during those years, we shall say, uh, involving personnel and uh, their qualifications, stuff of that nature. At that time, Jerry Davis assigned me to it in 82 as the permanent growth foreman assigned to it for the operating side, which meant mainly making sure that rules were complied with. And then we didn't do anything blatantly stupid, or if we did, like any good operating officer, So that went on until 87. There was a major shakeup in, uh, in Omaha. At that time, the steam locomotives were assigned to the mechanical department, but it was, there was a big shakeup back there that was taken away from the mechanical department and put in the operating department. The trouble was, when they took it away from the mechanical department, they left all the crew and they left all the budget money. So operating inherited the locomotive, no crew, no money, no maintenance people, or anything else. And I got a phone call one day that said, it's yours, fix it. Uh, which meant figure out how to run it with no people and no money. And we spent the next, having come from the Rock Island, I know how to do that. <laughs> the next couple of years round and round. Uh, borrow, steal, whatever you want to call it, uh, resourceful as we call it. Uh, that and uh, reallocating resources. Right? Somebody else that isn't using it at the moment and isn't watching at the moment. So, uh, we started to build up the fleet and we started to improve the operation or, and improve the condition of locomotives. Uh, these things have basically been run for previous 10 or 12 years with the idea of they're going to retire next year, let's not put any money in. Um, that was 30 years ago, but they still haven't retired. But we have put a ton of money into it. And I would say that as of the time I left, it was in as good a shape as it's ever been. Um, at the time I got it, it had a 55 mile an hour speed limit on it and a 12 car limit. Uh, 55 mile an hour speed limit was the first thing you got. And the next thing was car line. We started pulling freight trains, we started pulling busier, or bigger passenger trains. When they didn't run with the engine, they were just trying to preserve it so that they wouldn't have to put any money into it. We started running at 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. The engine loved it. So we just kept it up. And we started putting a lot of money back into it to maintain it. Uh, during my tenure, we put driver tires on it, we put crank pins in it, a new firebox. New tube sheets, new flumes, new combustion chamber, a lot of work for the running gear, all new springs, all new pins and bushings, we built all the brake rigging, new jacket, uh, new appliances, air pumps, dynamos, water pumps, all of that stuff. New wheels, uh, engine truck wheels, trailer truck wheels, all new tender wheels. Uh, just a, a ton of work was done over the years by a very small and very dedicated force. We never had more than five people or six people on the mechanical side. If you compare that to Norfolk Southern, it was also run the two engines and had a 17 man shop crew that never went on the road. Our shop crew always had one, which interrupted their, uh, their work on the engines, but they still managed to get it done little by little. And uh, stuff that would have been done in about a week or, or uh, 30 days or 45 days back to steam engine days may take three or four years. And uh, the results are, are pretty obvious. The 
This is uh, Spokane back in 1974, and I'm cheating because I can read up there in the number boxes. Expo 74. This is basically what the local movie looked like the uh, first time I saw it, with the exception of the Expo 84 and the late one. Uh, that didn't come with the deal. Right? <laughs> I probably should have had the number for us. <coughs> you see what it looked like. It's pretty well dressed up with a lot of silver that didn't use in regular service. Uh, a lot of polished. Silver head covers and stuff, which it did have when it was a regular service. And uh, a few other things that you had to have to comply with the rules. And this is January 1981, the first fire up, the first opening of the safety valves on the locomotive, and everybody said, we'll never run again. Uh, no people, no money, no knowledgeable people, no place to work, etc., 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 dragging out the parking lot. Two years later, two and a half, three years. <coughs> three years later, there she was. Mr. Kenneth Dick and Mr. Richmond had uh, graciously allowed the work to be done, figuring they couldn't do any harm. Now, everybody looked at each other and said, oh, now what are we going to do? They actually got this thing working. There was a lot of, uh, this was back when the mechanical part was running the show. They didn't like it. They thought, they, they thought they were the only people who knew anything about steam engines. And here comes a bunch of trainmen and engineers, signalmen, dispatchers, and Lord knows what else. And suddenly, we got the bigger over the in the 844 and it's steam. How did they do that? What can we do about it? As it turned out, they could do very little. Actually, nothing. This, uh, I don't know what the occasion is, immediately. Just when you announced the program was media, they brought the media over to town. Okay, yeah, there's the uh, Ron and Ron. Uh, yeah, Ron was there, I'm there, Kirk Knox, the late Kirk Knox, uh, several others. And this was the uh, announcement of the new program. I've often said that the STEAM program is the best kept secret of Cheyenne because so few people know about it, and especially in the media. I used to get calls all the time from Channel 5. When does the steam engine come into Cheyenne? Uh, it lives here. Did you know that? It's, it's here all the time. And of course, they, they change reporters and people about every six months, so it's a long part. Uh, to this day, they don't understand the important part of the nation. But there's an awful lot of older people that don't know that either. Mm -hmm. There's the Godfather. <laughs> That's our Lachman, of course. He was second generation Union Pacific. His father worked in the shops down there when they were uh, back in their eighties, in the teens, and twenties, and thirties, and forties. Art started in the forties. And his son is working down there now as the uh, manager of mechanical maintenance. Art was the guy with the steam background. He actually worked on these things in the shops and the roundhouses. And as he used to say, he still had most of his marbles. So we could ask him things and get a pretty good answer. And he could look at it and tell what it needed. So uh, when we had the opportunity just before he retired, we named the tool car for him, and it still carries his name to the state. And he's still around, and he still has most of his marbles. I think. Uh, on the left there is the late Jim Duncan. He just passed away earlier. Closest we 